What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with another podcast. Some good stuff. Once again, Skrillex from the clouds dropped his first album in nine years. I then dropped another one one day later. Very exciting. Also, got to get into another Chinese film, another Lunar New Year blockbuster, Hidden Blade, starring the great Tony Lung. And of course, we got to get into the latest Marvel blockbuster, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania, was just released. So, of course, make sure you subscribe to the pod anyway you listen. YouTube.com slash NostalgiaPod, Linktree.com slash NostalgiaPod for wherever you want to get it. Just make sure you get it. So yeah, let's jump right into uh, Skrillex. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Skrillex's second and third albums, Quest for Fire and Don't Get Too Close. Skrillex, of course, the EDM superstar. People know him, but he hasn't really been doing too much publicly, you know, uh, front and center for quite some time. And then out of nowhere, we got his first album in nine years, Quest for Fire. And then he surprise dropped his third album, Don't Get Too Close, the day, a day later. So I'm going to get into all those and just kind of talk about like where, where, where we're at with Skrillex now, electronic music. I think it's very interesting. So I kind of been feeling that like Skrillex was going to be dropping something just because we've been getting such a steady stream of singles the past few months, and especially once the calendar turned to 2023, but still kind of a, a sneak, sneaky drop here. Uh, you know, him, Skrillex doing a bunch of secret shows or uh, quickly announced shows around New York past week alongside Fred again and Fortet and, you know, capping that off with a quickly announced sold out show at Madison Square Garden where during the course of that show he dropped the third uh, the, the, the third album the second album this weekend don't get too close so it's kind of been a big it's kind of been a big whirlwind big uh, drop cycle big release cycle for Skrillex but I think it's very interesting how we've gotten to this point because like I said, the last Skrillex album, the debut full length, Recess, that was 2014. It's been a long time. I think just generally Skrillex has been largely removed as a public facing act with any regularity since, you know, a year later when that Jack U album came out with Diplo, uh, you know, the big hit with Bieber, of course. And since then, Skrillex has almost been more of a songwriter for pop for pop stars and has not really been doing too much, right? If you think about where EDM has gone to at this point, Skrillex, of course, the face of dubstep when dubstep was at his peak, you know, nearly 10 years ago now. And since then we've had, you know, I think trap as a subgenre really uh, wax and wane already. Dubstep has completely fallen out of favor in the mainstream sense. And, you know, hyper pop has really come into its complete existence in the time since Felix has been away. So there's been a lot of uh, changes, but this return from Skrillex, I think is quite interesting because he is, a different artist now than he was back then. I think that's really cool. He's definitely more focused on, I think, being in that pop firmament, being a pop producer and just a general pop artist. You know, notably these releases are still on Atlantic Records. And that's not to say that Skrillex doesn't have his finger on the pulse. I think he very much does. Of course, working with someone with such a long career like Fortet is one thing, but to also, of course, be working so closely with Fred again, you know, arguably the hottest DJ, the most critically interesting electronic act of the last year or so. Someone who's rapidly rising. And if you look further on the track list, you know, at the MSG show, he brings out Porter Robinson, someone else who I think has really come into his own, you know, during the pandemic era and is getting a lot of critical attention. I think Sonny, he just knows, knows, knows what's up, you know, working with Pink Panthers. For example, of course, Pink Panthers just got a top 10 hit with their song with Ice Spice. You know, it, it, I think it's it's quite interesting to see that even though Skrillex has quite c- clearly switched up the kind of music he was originally making, it's not that he is forsaking anything about himself at all. And if you think back on Recess, which I know is a old record, but he had already kind of been making this change into being a more fully functioning, fully developed electronic artist. So I think it's just really interesting, really cool. And it's hard not to compare these two albums against each other, again, released a day apart. So I'm just going to talk about both of them kind of in tandem here 
in general, I say I liked both of them. Quest for Fire, 15 songs, 45 minutes. It's very uh, tightly packed album with a lot of stuff in there. And then Don't Get Too Close is even shorter and even heavier on the guest list. I think Don't Get Too Close is probably a thing more easier to get into and listen to, just because I think it's a bit more pop-leaning, especially with those guests that seem to really complement what Skrillex is going for. But Quest for Fire is probably the more interesting record, I think, from a production standpoint. Not that I necessarily like it as much, though, which I think is kind of an interesting thing I've been trying to trying to gravitate towards here. But, you know, right off the bat with Quest for Fire, you have leave me like this which is one of the myriad singles there's been a ton of singles at this point but leave me like this the bobby raps feature i think that's a really interesting song really cool song and notably if you've been paying attention as a song that's been out in some capacity for a while because that of course was famously dropped during fred again's boiler room set last summer so people have heard that one but in general that's just a really fun song with the way like the drop uh, progression happens i enjoy that one and right right after that you have uh, ratatat another single featuring missy elliott you know missy of course sounds i think tremendous on that but another one where you just kind of build up with this amazing flow from missy and then you get into just everything a really engaging track um in general we have guests everywhere on this i think perhaps my favorite guest of all another single would be rumble which also has fred again on the on the beat here but featuring flodan the grime MC, one of the most, if not the most, signature like flow from UK hip hop. Uh, very unique voice for sure. I think he sounds great. Sounds right at home on Skrillex production. It's really fun. You know, Butterfly is another good example of the kind of artist Skrillex has become. You have Stara on that. Stara, of course, is a secret weapon for pop stars in terms of songwriting. But you have Skrillex, who 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 is in the know at this point, making a song with Stara. A song I like quite a bit right after that, Inhale, Exhale, featuring Aluna Francis of Aluna George, someone I like quite a bit. Uh, unsurprisingly, Aluna sounds great on electronic beat. You know, I think a song I didn't like too much would be Too Bizarre, which had been out in a different, uh, I think, a, a less stripped down version last year or two years ago. Too Bizarre featuring Sway Lee, among others. Maybe it's just my personal bias, but I'm really sick of Sway Lee not rapping. Like, I don't need him to do, like, Trippy Red sing songy stuff even if it sounds pretty good because Skrillex is going to make it sound good like I don't know just didn't really do it for me um Warp Tour all five with Pete Wentz that's kind of funny a nice nod to uh Skrillex's past of course before he uh, made his switch to electronic music back in the day uh Supersonic of course notably you have Dylan Brady on on there you know again Skrillex clearly in the know making music with Fortet making music with Fred again Pink Panthers of course you'd have Dylan Brady of 100 decks involved somehow because he's just kind of in the mix there and still here the last song has porter robinson as i noted so i think like on quest for fire a lot of interesting songs i don't know if it really feels like it comes together like as a cohesive record i would say it probably doesn't but all these ideas all these guests all these guest producers you know it's a lot but i think my takeaway in general is just that it's like it's interesting and it's different and more than anything i'm just happy that you have like a star electronic act back in the public eye once again because i always thought Skrillex was pretty interesting um you know obviously he went through a lot of critical uh derision you know during the heat of dose step uh, height of dubstep you know um, the bro step term being thrown pejoratively and Skrillex being the poster child for a lot of this pushback against this kind of take over electronic music but skrillex is someone who demonstrates time and time again with these two albums that he does his homework and he knows where the you know these roots are and i mean think back of when he won all those grammys you know 10 years ago he shouted out the people that did dubstep before him it's not like he hasn't been uh you know of uh, uh, paying homage to the past and i think that's kind of being paid for it once again here because he's making music with the people kind of at the forefront of the field nowadays in the time since he's been away. So uh, maybe I'm just kind of being a sucker for that, but I think it goes a long way in my opinion. Um, and then getting into the second album, Don't Get Too Close, which again, surprise dropped in the middle of this five hour MSG sold out set with Fred again and, and Fortet. Um, track one, 
Don't Leave Me Like This, you might recall. Sounds a lot like the first track on the other album, Leave Me Like This. Kind of a cool sequel track. Doesn't work quite as well, but and it's also a lot shorter, but I think it's kind of fun. Uh, way back, that's Pink Panthers. I don't really need Trippy Red on this. You know, I don't know. Like, Have Trippy Red make songs with Diplo. I feel like we don't. He doesn't bring enough to the table, to be on a Skrillex record, to this kind of Skrillex record. But track three, I think, is very interesting, would be Selecta. Just like that pulsing bass from Skrillex on the beat there. Sounds great. And then, of course, Beam, who I haven't loved Beam, but of course, he kind of came out of nowhere, Kanye collaborator the past few years. I think Beam sounds pretty good on that. Probably the best I thought Beam sounded quite a bit, quite a while. So I like that one. Uh... Right after that, Ceremony. Of course, he, Skrillex has Young Lean on this album. Why wouldn't he? Love it. Uh, going through, I think, Bad For Me. Sounds awesome. Chief Keef. Sounds actually right at home, perhaps surprisingly, uh, on this. Loved it. Uh, 3 a.m. You know, again, Skrillex having his finger on the pulse. You have Prentice. They're on the, on the, on the vocals, on, on the chorus. They're very youthful vocals because, again, Prentice is like, 15 years old, you know, brand new artist. So another great example of, I think, Skrillex just kind of bringing you what you should want to hear, even if maybe you're you're not as up on it as he is. Don't go. Justin Bieber, you know, running it back after Where Are You Now. Uh, I think the song's okay. I think Bieber sounds fine. Don Tolliver sounds fine, but nothing special, I don't think. Mixed Signals, another Sway Lee song. Again, nothing special. But I think these are just kind of, uh, more easy to put on songs, perhaps lower denominator songs as well, which is why, like I said, I think Don't Get Too Close is easier to listen to, but Quest for Fire is, I think, more interesting musically. I think that's kind of obvious here. Don't Get Too Close is the one song I didn't like off the album, the title track here. Uh, just a bit too soft um, for me. and I think it was kind of a weird a weird vibe compared to the rest of the album. But um, I mean, Mixed Signals, it is a bit lively, you know, even if Still didn't really love it. So just in general, like, shout out Skrillex. I hope he continues to stick around here. And even if he wants to slow down a little bit, I have a hard time feeling that it's going to be the case because he's taken such a long time. You know, he had some personal troubles the past few years. Seems to have really found a creative reawakening. And just in general, like, having that proximity to people that are, like, super hot, like Fred again and also Porter Robinson. Just very exciting, you know, and I, I wonder if this will help usher in a new new era in electronic music. You know, you know, on one hand, we had Beyonce bringing us a lot of throwback disco and dance and, and uh, you know, club vibes the past year, and Drake doing it to a way less successful degree. Uh, but Fred, again, has kind of been like that, that through line, right? And I'll be curious to see if Fred continues to work so closely with Skrillex, you have to imagine we'll be hearing more of them uh, together soon, which is really exciting. So let me know, what do you think of the two Skrillex albums? Are you happy Skrillex is back? Are you happy about Skrillex's new direction uh, musically? Uh, make sure you follow the now sound of Best of 2023 Spotify playlist for my favorite songs of the year across all genres. Check the link below for that. And for more music reviews, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. And now let's move on to the Chinese film, Hidden Blade, starring Tony Leung. What's up? Welcome back to Now Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Hidden Blade, the new film starring Tony Leung, the latest Chinese blockbuster to get a small release here in the States. This, you know, not as big a deal, not, not as widely watched as Full River Red or The Wandering Earth 2, which I did review. Check the uh, channel for that. But... Hidden Blade did make over $100 million. It was still a very successful film as one of the Lunar New Year uh, new releases over in China. And this had my attention for really two reasons. One, the setting. It's a you know, noir film set in the World War II uh, backdrop, 1930s era, specifically the uh, Second uh, Sino-Japanese War, the war between China and Japan, kind of alongside uh, World War II. And also because it stars the great Tony Leung, one of, if not the most significant and most celebrated actors in the history of Chinese and Hong Kong cinema. You know, Americans probably recognize or remember Tony Leung was the villain in shang Chi: Legend of the Ten Rings two years ago. He does not really work in Hollywood all that much, though, so you gotta meet him where he is. In this case, that would be in The Hidden Blade. And this is a film that, again, I'm happy, happy I have to see it uh, 
see it in person. You know, the releases are, are small for Chinese films here in the U.S. and not a lot of showtime. So when I did see it, it was completely packed, probably the most packed theater I've been in in, in, in a while. Um, and this is a movie that, you know, I really wanted to like, really wanted to love even. It's kind of right up my alley in terms of, uh, you know, just if you know the history at all, Japan is operating a puppet regime, puppet government over China out of Shanghai. And you have kind of all this, this spycraft going on. Uh, you know, enemies on all sides, all these different factions. You have the Japanese uh, government. You have the Chinese people working with the Japanese government, the collaborators. You have people resisting this Japanese occupation. And those people would include Chinese nationalists, you know, in terms of uh, the Shanghai Shek, uh, you know, Republic regime, and also the largely growing uh, Chinese communist faction that, of course, people know will eventually come to power. And you have the nationalists and the communists you know, forming a temporary alliance to get rid of the Japanese so that they can resume fighting amongst themselves for the control of China. Uh, you don't know who is on what side, all this espionage, uh, double agents. Sounds great. Sounds fun, right? And when you have Tony Lung as a spy chief, like, again, sign me up, right? But I think the issue with, with Hidden Blade is it was quite long. It was over two hours, which wouldn't necessarily be an issue, but... The movie is distractingly nonlinear. I celebrate movies that are nonlinear all the time. It's often done to great effect. In the case of Hidden Blade, which is directed by uh, Chang Er, Hidden Blade is just like kind of needlessly confusing as nonlinearity. Like the audience is kind of kept at arm's length in terms of when things are taking place or what characters are really up to for a long stretch of time. And, and to me, it kind of dulls the effectiveness of big movements in the plot, which I found just a bit disappointing. Like I'm just kind of sitting there trying to track what's happening. And it kind of takes you out of like the dramatic heft of what you're supposed to be watching. Um, in the process of this, I think really across the board, all the female characters are really uh, underserved. They have very little to do. And also the nonlinearity doesn't really help them. Like you have a long stretch of time where you don't, spend any time with them at all and like then when you do meet them you're supposed to care about their relationships with these male characters you know a bit better like i just don't think it really works and man i, I just found that really disappointing and like when the movie ends i'm just kind of sitting there like ah if this was just told in a more conventional manner i think it's like significantly better you don't even have to change that much really just order this in a more coherent manner maybe take away there's a few subplots with some uh Japanese soldiers, for example, you probably could eliminate that and when it made a big difference. Just kind of focus, I think, on like the espionage and the double crossing between the Japanese government and the Chinese collaborators and the people fighting against them and like knowing like who's on what side, right? Like Tony Lung as director, he he's working with the Japanese government. Is that where he's uh, siding with? I think if you're going into the movie, you can probably understand and predict the uh, idealistic leaning of this film in terms of what kind of message this movie is going to send that being said i don't think it's like overtly propaganda uh in any way like yes it's going to be pro-communist that shouldn't come as a shock at the same time though if it wasn't pro-communist what would that be it would be pro-japanese occupation i don't think it's fair to expect something like that to come out when it wasn't uh, in sync with reality, right? So yeah, is it going to be a bit of uh, rah-rah about uh, the Communist Party that would eventually take over? Yes. I don't think it's in your face. It doesn't really distract from the movie at all. It wasn't a big deal to me. Uh, but yeah, I just was a bit disappointed in that plot. However, what I did like was Tony Lung, I think as people know, yeah, he's in his 60s now, but man, put a cigarette in that guy's hand, watch him smolder, the looks he gives with his face, with his eyes. He's just a tremendous actor. People know this by now. I also was quite enamored with uh, Hiroki Mori as Watanabe, who plays kind of like the central Japanese government official that you um, come to come to meet and his relationship with uh, director He. Uh, really great see, uh, re scene stealer, honestly, the way he would chew on scenery and kind of like a likable uh, villain. In terms of, uh, you know, I don't think he was like a caricature of like a negative, uh, you know, imperialist Japanese person by any means. 
uh, I liked him a lot. I liked the relationship and this kind of a lot, a lot of these, these, these scenes are just people talking in rooms. And I think because you have great actors and largely when the movie gets to be about individual moments, the scenes are pretty good. The scenes are pretty well written. It's just like the connective tissue of the movie that really falls apart for me. I think the, one of the weaker elements of the movie though, would be um, Mr. Yi, who's kind of like a, like a protege, like spy agent under director. He, you know, a, a young, young up and comer in a certain sense. He's played uh, by uh, Wang Yibo, who is like a Chinese like idol, you know, like pop star uh, actor, you know, multi-talented guy. I don't think his performance is all too good. No offense to him, but I just don't think he really was strong enough at carrying some of these emotional beats that he eventually has to deliver on. Um, just a bit, a bit wooden, a bit stoic in his face, and like when you're putting him up against some of these other more experienced actors. Uh, it kind of shows that he's not quite up to snuff with them. Not necessarily a demerit against him. He's just not as talented as those guys are. It's it is what it is. So that kind of I don't say he was distracting. Like he had the physicality aspect for sure, but just dramatically, he couldn't quite hang with someone like Tony Long. Which again, not that big a surprise, honestly. Um, yeah, I think like if you're into like this style of movie, I think it's still definitely worth a watch. And it's not like there's a ton of movies made about the uh, second uh, Sino-Japanese War. So it, it, it's it's fun, I think, to kind of be in the mix with that, right? Like Especially us as Americans. Like we know World War II largely through the realm of the Pacific and, and how the Japanese were fighting the Americans at that point. But not that there's any secret about the Japanese you know, occupation and especially atrocities committed across China. Their obsession with taking over Manchuria is a very f- big focus in Hidden Blade. But the, the Chinese specific stuff is largely not uh, dram- dramatized as often as you'd expect, given how vast World War II is and the European uh, Western lean you can expect over in Hollywood. So I think it's definitely still worth a shot, especially for Tony Lung. You know, he's like worth the price of admission, I would say. So yeah, let me know. I mean, what did you think of Hidden Blade? Have you seen it? Um, you know, I saw The Wandering Two as well. Did a review on that. How'd you like these two movies, which are so, so different? <laughs> Let me know. And uh, if more Chinese films are getting releases, I will be talking about them. I'm hoping Full River Red, the Zhang Yimou, huge blockbuster, gets a release. If so, I will be talking about it. So make sure you subscribe, youtube.com slash Nostalgia Pod. And for more movie reviews, I'll see you next time. All right, now let's move on to Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. What's up? Welcome back to Now Stata. Dave here with a review of Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, 31st Marvel Cinematic Universe film, third Ant-Man film, Peyton Reed back in the director chair, all our usual suspects from Ant-Man back, Paul Rudd as Scott Lang, Evangeline Lilly, Michael Douglas, Michelle Pfeiffer, the gang's all here, Catherine Newton, a newcomer as the aged up Cassie Lang, and of course, the proper introduction of the Marvel Cinematic Universe's new big bad, King the Conqueror, played by the great Jonathan Majors. So definitely a lot of anticipation going into Ant-Man 3. Less so for being an Ant-Man movie and more so about being the movie debut of Kang, who of course we did meet in the finale of Loki season one in the summer of 2021, a different version of Kang. And I think that's going to be a big part about this movie is that uh, the multiverse and, and variants and all that's going to be a huge part of Marvel storytelling. Uh, that seems quite obvious, but let's just get right into it. I think Ant-Man 3 is largely unsuccessful for really a key conceptual reason. Not that there's not things to enjoy about it. Jonathan Majors uh, is amazing. I love him. Even he cannot lift this movie up on his mighty biceps uh, as much as he might try. Ant-Man 3, unfortunately, kind of has like two conflicting aims as a film. It's trying to be this hard sci-fi movie that takes place completely in this quantum realm, you know, CGI fest that it is. It's trying to be this hard sci-fi story introducing the audience to the Marvel Cinematic Universe's new Thanos, the new big bad, who will be, you know, the, the villain in the upcoming Avengers movies in 2025 and 2026 trying to do that all of that while also being the third ant-man movie and ant-man is just ill-conceived as a vehicle 
to accomplish these game, aims and in the process doesn't feel like an effective Ant-Man movie either. So it's really just a huge mixed bag to me. And, you know, I've been mixed to positive on the last run of Marvel with the Phase 4 uh, films that we've gotten. Done a review on all of them. Check them out. YouTube.com slash Nostalgia Pod. The thing, though, is like, you can't help but feel like there's a general sentiment that Marvel has been not hitting at quite the same rate lately. You know, with a few exceptions. We trust Sony and Spider-Man with Tom Holland. We expect Guardians 3 in May to be good. But largely, like, you know, things have been just okay. I love Shang-Chi so much, but largely, we've been on a, a rockier run. A big part of that, I think, is the uh, volume of MCU television shows that have definitely worn people down, and we now know that the show releases on Disney Plus will be slowing down. Uh, so maybe this can slowly correct itself. But just, I think, as as a as a idea, as a prospect of how to introduce Kang and making it happen in the third Ant-Man movie just was not a good idea to me. You know, the first two Ant-Man movies, and really whenever we've met Ant-Man, Paul Rudd plays Scott Lang really well. Those are heist movies. Those are comedies. Those are largely smaller stakes stuff. They've been setting this course to the quantum realm since the first Ant-Man movie. I'm not ignoring that. But what these movies attempt to be, I think, is just gone when you try and do Quantum Mania. You know, it's not about a heist. Really, anything about Scott Lang is kind of ignored over the course of this movie. And they yada yada that relationship, that make up for lost time aspect between Scott and Cassie. I think a big issue with that is like, we just kind of meet the family, you know, meet the Lang Van Dyne clan in the beginning. And before we know it, we're all in the quantum realm. Literally everyone is there. No one is on the outside. And we're just kind of in this kind of race against the clock survival story. And that's, that's, that's what it is. And, you know, Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer have very little to do. Evangeline Lilly as the Wasp has exceedingly little to do. A kind of offensive how little she got to accomplish in this movie. And even Scott, I think, just is a bit kind of hapless in the movie. You know, and I like Catherine Newton. Uh, she's been in a lot of high-profile stuff at this point. Her is Cassie Lang, eventually going to be the new Ant-Man pillar of new Avengers down the line. She'll fit right in. She'll be great. Um, she's still quite young. Great choice. But that doesn't serve this movie. Just like we know Jonathan Majors is awesome as, uh, awesome as Kang because he's a great actor. That doesn't really serve this movie, though. You know, I think um, everything with the family, I just think, doesn't really work. You know, big issue is, like, Pfeiffer, like, the whole aspect of this movie is just because uh, Pfeiffer hasn't told anyone about her 30 years spent in the quantum realm with Kang. She just withholds information. And then once they get all thrown in there and she's, you know, kind of being the uh, survivalist guide for everyone to keep everyone alive, she still won't tell them anything. It is a bit frustrating. You know, I think um, being in the quantum realm, a lot of Star Wars influence, I think, for sure, in terms of the science fiction stuff. I don't necessarily would say that the, sci the, the CGI looks bad, but there is a ton of it. And you don't really spend any time dwelling on anything, right? Like Kang's big city. Don't really do anything in it, except spend time in one room. The rebel slash survivor people, where you meet William Jackson Harper's character and David Dasmashian's uh, ooze guy. They're like so thinly drawn because we barely spend any time with them that it's fine, but I just don't think there's like enough heft behind the quantum realm. I just didn't feel... I don't know, I, just did, I wasn't super engaged by it. It really has nothing to do with the quality of the effects either. I think it's just like, conceptually, we're not spending any time coloring in the quantum realm, which is supposed to be this entire like new dimension that exists under or around everything, however you want to explain it. But it just doesn't feel, I think, interesting or even that different from, say, like spending time in... I don't know, the cosmic space in the Guardians movies, for example, or Eternals, you know, it just, I don't know, it just felt, felt a little off to me. And I think the most interesting potential the Quantum Realm could have given us was towards the end there where Scott has been given this 
you know, Faustian bargain in a sense from Kang. You have to help me, the bad guy, get me the thing I want so that you can save your family. Classic storytelling trope, but it's classic for a reason because it's really effective and dramatic. That did, did it make sense what they were really getting the, the you know, getting the, the getting Kang's orb going again? No, but it's fine. You can yada yada that. I wanted that dramatic heft to, I think, be richer, but that, and it had a potential to do it, right? You had that, like, the probability field aspect of the quantum realm. Interesting premise. And in a brief moment, it was almost the most Ant Man y of all things, you know, watching all the Scots work together. But I just think, like, tonally, the film kind of shies away from, like, anything landing right you have all these moments where like the Ant-Man humor has to kick in to shower you in any le- le- levity when there perhaps was e- going to be any semblance of negativity or drama <laughs> and I don't know like by the end they're like Kang gets sucked into the orb and perhaps killed this variant of Kang somehow I, I would have loved if there was like any stakes to anything that happened to the family towards the end there, I thought, oh, we're Douglas and Pfeiffer going to get stranded. Were we going to lose some of the older characters? No. Well, everyone makes it out with really nothing of consequence has happened. To some people, like, that's okay. This was kind of like a weird bottle episode for the Ant-Man story and in the process gave us Kang uh, fully formed. I guess that can be a takeaway. I just don't think it's like <laughs> dramatically interesting as a film and it's not that i expect marvel to be like the most deep engaging thing ever but coming off black panther wakanda forever you know there are richer themes to be had in these movies if you're interested in doing them and again ant-man lower stakes comedy doesn't need to be black panther in terms of weight but at least let some things land you know even like modok who i think was a, was a fun surprise even funner surprise that it was a combination with a uh, yellow jacket, Darren from Ant-Man one, Corey Stoll coming back when Modoc dies. They, then they joke about it. They, they laugh about it. You know, they, they, they can't let anything actually like stick for even a second without making some jokes. You know, d- don't be a, don't be a dick is like the takeaway of all that. It's like, okay, fine. But I don't know. I, I just thought a lot of this was like super ill-conceived. That being said, good performers, as usual, right? Nice to see Bill Murray show up and be Bill Murray for a split second, alluding to uh, him and Pfeiffer having sex in the quantum realm. That was funny. Michael Douglas' reactions, those were funny. Uh, I'm here for that. Would I have loved Michael Pena to somehow be in an Ant-Man movie again? Yes, Luis is hilarious in the first two movies, but no, like, that's not what this movie is interested in. That being said, we have to talk about King the Conqueror. We have to talk about Jonathan Majors. Jonathan Majors has begun his amazing 2023. Of course, he'll be the villain in Creed 3 very soon, and also is the star of the Searchlight film Magazine Dreams, which his performance got a lot of uh, love for, and I'm sure we'll be talking about come award season next year. But it, it, Majors can only do, so I think, so much with like this movie that doesn't actually give him a whole lot to do. He just kind of gets the stew and steam and be bad but his powers and his motivations are largely undercooked like this is a, a very conqueror variant of kang fine but like what kang does and how he does things i don't think is very well defined and do, certainly what he does do in terms of like his powers and controlling people and like shooting stuff out of his suit none of it really is differentiated beyond anything that anyone else has done in the history of the marvel films so i would like to see more uh, of kang in subsequent films to make his you know avengers kang dynasty villain villainy really land and i'm sure we will be getting that uh, especially in loki season two as we know for the post credit scene but majors is able to chew on scenery because he's just like, that strong talented of a dramatic actor they finally let him like beat up scott at the end it's kind of ludicrous that scott's able to like beat him up back in his like normal state uh, but that's Marvel for you. You know, <laughs> they rip up the suit a little bit so you can see how absolutely yoked Jonathan Majors as a person is in terms of how jacked he is. But they largely make him cover up, which I think honestly is, is a bit of a mistake given how 
shredded the man is, but that's not how Kang is usually portrayed, so I get it. But um, yeah, I just I don't know, like it's not even at the end there too, like the de- Deus Ex Mahina being like the return of the ants. You know, Michael Douglas says little like you know animal ants. It's cool, but I don't know. I I, I honestly found like a movie like Eternals bit more interesting not that it's more successful i don't think it is but that at least i think had like more interesting goals as as a marvel movie whereas this movie so clearly had only one goal in mind which is present the audience with kang oh and by the way here's Catherine newton as cassie for the future other than that it doesn't really do anything for continuing the ant-man story nor does it take anyone off the ant-man board and close any loops either everyone's still in play so it's just kind of a mixed like interstitial to me uh the next marvel movie will be the marvels which has been delayed out of july into uh, november sorry that'd be the, the, the last one of the year guardians 3 comes out in may the marvels has been pushed back i think it's smart to give more time to these movies we don't need to release three movies between february and july nice choice Guardians 3 I have a lot of faith in, but that's also kind of a product of old Marvel, right? This is the end of things. James Gunn moving to DC. Uh, all these Guardians characters seemingly happy to hang up their capes. I'm sure we'll see some of them soon again. But like the Guardians films have run their course. The Marvels is a huge question mark due to the mixed success, but a kindly of the first movie. Of course, the introduction of Kamala Khan from the Miss Marvel TV series should liven things up. But I don't know, like... The through line, storytelling wise, is like we're still at the very beginning of this, right? And like starting off with Kang, but like the whole like there's another Kang out there. The variants, you kill one, does that make any difference at all? Like I think they have a lot of storytelling work left to be done in terms of communicating like incursions and timelines fracturing and how that all matters, like. They have to do a lot of work in the lead up to Secret Wars to I think make that make sense to the average audience member. Because I don't know about you, but like if I watch Jonathan Majors die another three, four, five times in the next few years, different versions of Kang Shore, but like I don't know how effective that's gonna this last. We certainly watched Thanos die uh two different times in the Avengers films. I don't know. I have a lot wait and see. I don't think they totally nailed setting up Kang yet, even with that post grad scene showing you all the other versions of Kang, including Immortus and Ramatut and all those dudes, you know. They got more work to do. And we'll see um, how they achieve that in the movies, because I just don't think you can expect audience members to like know and understand two seasons of Loki and use that as their grounding principle. They should want to watch Loki. It was the best MCU series for sure, but you need to do the work in the movies too. And even watching Loki season one, I don't think makes a huge difference with Ant-Man. And that's just a question of execution and intent and concept as I've gotten into. So more to come on MCU, more to come on this new storytelling front. I am happy to see that Marvel's going to be slowing their roll with the TV series and t- giving things more time to breathe, giving at VFX more time to be done. All that sounds great. We don't need six show, four shows and four movies a year, three shows and four movies a year, as we got the last two years. Don't need all that. They're figuring that out, and this is largely driven uh, by costs, but they're figuring it out one way or another. So let's hope creatively that the movies can start to pick it up, because I think Ant-Man is a Three is a kind of a rough starting point in the film front for this new story, this phase five plan. So we'll see. But let me leave a comment below. How'd you feel about Ant-Man 3? How'd you feel about the introduction of Kang to the movies? Are you excited about seeing more Kang? Which are you most looking forward to next? Guardians 3, Marvels? How are you feeling about phase five? And just in general, for more movie reviews, subscribe and I'll see you next time. And just in general, for more movie reviews, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. All right, that'll do it for the pod this week. I think next week is, I'm really excited to talk about a lot of the stuff we have. So, Cocaine Bear is coming out. This will be a really fun movie. I'm sure that'll just be enjoyable. It's also an Emily Bronte uh, biopic with Emma Mackey, who I love. 
So we get into that. New music from Gorillaz and Logic. Cool. But of course, Formula One, Drive to Survive, Season 5. is say Netflix on Friday. So I'll be getting into that extensively. Uh, but I'll see you next time. Yeah.